Chapter Four of A House to Let. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. A House to Let by Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, Elizabeth Gaskell, Adelaide Anne Proctor. Chapter Four. Three Evenings in the House. Number One. Yes, it looked dark and dreary, that long and narrow street. Only the sound of the rain and the tramp of passing feet, the duller glow of the fire and gathering mists of night, to mark how slow and weary the long day's cheerless flight. Watching the sullen fire, hearing the dreary rain, Drop after drop run down on the darkening window-pane. Chill was the heart of Bertha, chill as that winter day, For the star of her life had risen only to fade away. The voice that had been so strong to bid the snare depart, The true and earnest will, and the calm and steadfast heart, Were now weighed down by sorrow were quivering now with pain. The clear path now seemed clouded, and all her grief in vain. Duty, right, truth, who promised to help and save their own, seemed spreading wide their pinions to leave her there alone. So, turning from the present to well-known days of yore, she called on them to strengthen and guard her soul once more. She thought how in her girlhood her life was given away, The solemn promise spoken she kept so well to-day, How to her brother Herbert she had been help and guide, And how his artist nature on her calm strength relied. How through life's fret and turmoil the passion and fire of art In him was soothed and quickened, by her true sister heart. How future hopes had always been for his sake alone, and now what strange new feeling possessed her as its own. Her home, each flower that breathed there, the wind sigh soft and low, each trembling spray of ivy, the river's murmuring flow, the shadow of the forest, Sunset or twilight dim, dear as they were, were dearer by leaving them for him. And each year, as it found her in the dull, feverish town, saw self still more forgotten, and selfish care kept down by the calm joy of evening that brought him to her side, to warn him with wise counsel or praise with tender pride. Her heart, her life, her future, her genius, only meant another thing to give him, and be therewith content. Today what words had stirred her, her soul could not forget? What dream had filled her spirit with strange and wild regret? To leave him for another, could it indeed be so? Could it have cost such anguish to bid this vision go? Was this her faith? Was Herbert the second in her heart? Did it need all this struggle to bid a dream depart? And yet within her spirit a far-off land was seen, A home which might have held her, a love which might have been. And life, not the mere being of daily ebb and flow, But life itself had claimed her, and she had let it go. Within her heart there echoed again the well-known tune That promised this bright future, and asked her for its own. Then words of sorrow, broken by half-reproachful pain, And then a farewell, spoken in words of cold disdain. 
Where now was the stern purpose that nerved her soul so long? Whence came the words she uttered, so hard, so cold, so strong? What right had she to banish a hope that God had given? Why must she choose earth's portion, and turn aside from heaven? Today, was it this morning, if this long fearful strife was but the work of hours, what would be years of life? Why did a cruel heaven for such great suffering call? And why, O oh, still more cruel, must her own words do all? Did she repent, O oh, sorrow? Why do we linger still to take thy loving message, and do thy gentle will? See her tears fall more slowly, the passionate murmurs cease, and back upon her spirit flow strength and love and peace. The fire burns more brightly, the rain has passed away, Herbert will see no shadow upon his home to-day, only that Bertha greets him with doubly tender care, kissing a fonder blessing down on his golden hair. Number two. The studio is deserted, palette and brush laid by. The sketch rests on the easel, the paint is scarcely dry. And silence, who seems always within her depths to bear the next sound that will utter, now holds a dumb despair. So Bertha feels it, listening with breathless, stony fear. Waiting the dreadful summons each minute brings more near, When the young life, now ebbing, shall fail and pass away Into that mighty shadow who shrouds the house to-day. But why, when the sick chamber is on the upper floor, Why dares not Bertha enter within the close-shut door? If he, her all, her brother, lies dying in that gloom, what strange mysterious power has sent her from the room? It is not one week's anguish that can have changed her so. Joy has not died here lately, struck down by one quick blow. But cruel months have needed their long relentless chain to teach that shrinking manner of helpless, hopeless pain. The struggle was scarce over last Christmas Eve had brought, The fibres still were quivering of the one wounded thought, When Herbert, who unconscious had guessed no inward strife, Bade her in pride and pleasure welcome his fair young wife. Bade her rejoice, and smiling, although his eyes were dim, Thanked God he thus could pay her the care she gave to him. This fresh, bright life would bring her a new and joyous fate. O oh, Bertha, check the murmur that cries, Too late, too late. Too late. Could she have known it a few short weeks before, That his life was completed and needing hers no more? She might, oh, sad repining, what might have been, forget. It was not, should suffice us, to stifle vain regret. He needed her no longer. Each day it grew more plain, first with a startled wonder, then with a wondering pain. Love, why, his wife best gave it. Comfort durst Bertha speak. Counsel, when quick resentment flushed on the young wife's cheek. No more long talks by firelight of childish times long past, and dreams of future greatness which he must reach at last. Dreams where her purer instinct with truth unerring told where was the worthless gilding, and where refined gold. 
slowly but surely ever, Dora's poor jealous pride, which she called love for Herbert, drove Bertha from his side. And spite of nervous effort to share their altered life, she felt a check to Herbert, a burden to his wife. This was the least, for Bertha feared, dreaded, knew at length how much his nature owed her of truth and power and strength, and watched the daily failing of all his nobler part, low aims, weak purpose, telling in lower, weaker art. And now, when he is dying, the last words she could hear must not be hers, but given the bride of one short year. The last care is another's. The last prayer must not be the one they learned together beside their mother's knee. Summoned at last, she kisses the clay-cold, stiffening hand, and, reading pleading efforts to make her understand, answers with solemn promise, in clear but trembling tone, to Dora's life henceforward she will devote her own. Now all is over. Bertha dares not remain to weep, but soothes the frightened Dora into a sobbing sleep. The poor weak child will need her. Oh, who can dare complain when God sends a new duty to comfort each new pain? Number three. The house is all deserted in the dim evening gloom. Only one figure passes slowly from room to room, and, pausing at each doorway, seems gathering up again within her heart the relics of bygone joy and pain. There is an earnest longing in those who onward gaze, looking with weary patience towards the coming days. There is a deeper longing, more sad, more strong, more keen, those know it who look backward and yearn for what has been. At every hearth she pauses, touches each well-known chair, gazes from every window, lingers on every stair. What have these months brought Bertha now one more year is past? This Christmas Eve shall tell us the third one and the last. The wilful wayward Dora, in those first weeks of grief, could seek and find in Bertha strength, soothing and relief. And Bertha, last sad comfort true woman-heart can take, had something still to suffer and do for Herbert's sake. Spring, with her western breezes from Indian islands, bore to Bertha news that Leonard would seek his home once more. What was it, joy or sorrow, what were they, hopes or fears, that flushed her cheeks with crimson and filled her eyes with tears? He came, and who so kindly could ask and hear her tell Herbert's last hours? for Leonard had known and loved him well. Daily he came, and Bertha, poor weary heart at length, weighed down by others' weakness, could rest upon his strength. Yet not the voice of Leonard could her true care beguile, that turned to watch rejoicing Dora's reviving smile. So from that little household the worst gloom passed away, the one bright hour of evening lit up the live-long day. Days passed, the golden summer in sudden heat bore down its blue, bright, glowing sweetness upon the scorching town, and sights and sounds of country came in the warm, soft tune sung by the honeyed breezes born on the wings of June. One twilight hour, but earlier than usual, Bertha thought, she knew the fresh sweet fragrance of flowers that Leonard brought. Through opened doors and windows it stole up through the gloom, and with appealing sweetness drew Bertha from her room. Yes, he was there, 
and pausing just near the opened door to check her heart's quick beating, she heard, and paused still more, his low voice, Dora's answers, his pleading. Yes, she knew the tone, the words, the accents. She once had heard them, too. Would Bertha blame her? Leonard's low, tender answer came. Bertha was far too noble to think or dream of blame. And was he sure he loved her? Yes, with the one love given, once in a lifetime only, with one soul and one heaven. Then came a plaintive murmur. Dora had once been told that he and Bertha, Dearest, Bertha is far too cold to love, and I, my Dora, if once I fancied so, it was a brief delusion, and over long ago. Between the past and present, on that bleak moment's height, she stood, as some lost traveller, by a quick flash of light, seeing a gulf before him, with dizzy sick despair, reels to clutch backward, but to find a deeper chasm there. The twilight grew still darker, the fragrant flowers more sweet, the stars shone out in heaven, the lamps gleamed down the street, and hours passed in dreaming over their new-found fate, ere they could think of wondering why Bertha was so late. She came, and calmly listened. In vain they strove to trace if Herbert's memory shadowed in grief upon her face. No blame, no wonder showed there. No feeling could be told. Her voice was not less steady her manner not more cold. They could not hear the anguish that broke in words of pain through that calm summer midnight. My Herbert, mine again. Yes, they have once been parted, but this day shall restore the long-lost one. She claims him. My Herbert, mine once more. Now Christmas Eve, returning, saw Bertha stand beside the altar, greeting Dora, again a smiling bride. And now the gloomy evening sees Bertha pale and worn, leaving the house for ever, to wander out forlorn. Forlorn, nay, not so. Anguish shall do its work at length. Her soul passed through the fire shall gain still purer strength. Somewhere there waits for Bertha an earnest, noble part. And meanwhile God is with her, God and her own true heart. I could warmly and sincerely praise the little poem when Jabba had done reading it, but I could not say that it tended in any degree towards clearing up the mystery of the empty house. Whether it was the absence of the irritating influence of Trottle, or whether it was simply fatigue, I cannot say, but Jarber did not strike me that evening as being in his usual spirits, and though he declared that he was not in the least daunted by his want of success thus far, and that he was resolutely determined to make more discoveries, he spoke in a languid, absent manner, and shortly afterwards took his leave at rather an early hour. When Trottle came back, and when I indignantly taxed him with philandering, he not only denied the imputation, but asserted that he had been employed on my service, and in consideration of that, boldly asked for leave of absence for two days, and for a morning to himself afterwards to complete the business, in which he solemnly declared that I was interested. In remembrance of his long and faithful service to me, I did violence to myself and granted his request, and he, on his side, engaged to explain himself to my satisfaction 
in a week's time, on Monday evening the 20th. A day or two before, I sent to Jarber's lodgings to ask him to drop in to tea. His landlady sent back an apology for him that made my hair stand on end. His feet were in hot water, his head was in a flannel petticoat, a green shade was over his eyes, the rheumatism was in his legs, and a mustard poultice was on his chest. He was also a little feverish, and rather distracted in his mind about Manchester marriages, a dwarf, and three evenings or evening parties, his landlady was not sure which, in an empty house with the water-rate unpaid. Under these distressing circumstances I was necessarily left alone with Trottle. His promised explanation began, like Jarber's discoveries, with the reading of a written paper. The only difference was that Trottle introduced his manuscript under the name of a report. End of chapter 4 Recording by Ruth Golding